Hi everyone, dear colleagues, dear listeners. My name is Andrew Mertzalov and I'm glad to welcome you to the seminar of the Moscow Center for Consciousness Studies, New Ideas in Philosophy. Today in our seminar, we will discuss the latest book of Professor John Martin Fisher, Death, Immortality and Meaning in Life, published at the Oxford University Press 2019. John Martin Fisher is a distinguished professor of philosophy at the University of California, Riverside, and university professor in the University of California. We're happy that Professor Fisher is here with us today. Nice to meet you. We will try to take a full advantage of your presence today, so our agenda will be a bit tough, maybe. Uh, first of all, we'll have kind of 20 minutes for Professor Fisher's brief presentation of his ideas discussed in the book. Then maybe some brief clarification questions from our participants, uh, if there would be some. And then we will turn to the discussion. Our participants uh, will have brief speeches kind of five or maybe seven minutes per person. Uh, there could be some questions, commentaries, maybe critics. So then Professor Fisher will have kind of 30 or 40 minutes uh, for the reply. And then our seminar will be finished. So now I put the microphone to Professor Fisher. Please, you're welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I enjoyed my time in Moscow and Russia very much. And I have many uh, pleasant memories, and I'm um, glad to have the chance to come back, even if it's just uh, on Zoom. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I appreciate the invitation. I um, wasn't uh, sure in advance what the format would be, and I would just try to keep my remarks a little shorter, and I would like to um, invite a lot of questions. I think... Uh, in a seminar like this, question and answer works very well and interaction. So uh, let's let's try and do that as much as possible. I've been, uh, let me say, as background, <clears throat> I've been thinking about these issues. Well, you have to think about them if you're a human being. <laughs> so uh, since I, I was young, but it, I let's see, I'm trying to remember. In graduate school, I read the famous article by Thomas Nagel called Death. I also read the article by Bernard Williams, uh, The Macropolis Case, Reflections on the Tedium of Immortality. And those two articles got me interested. I think a lot of my philosophical work, it turns out, builds on or engages with some famous articles in Anglo-American philosophy in the 1970s, in the early or the late 1960s and the 1970s. So Harry Frankfurt's work uh, on alternative possibilities and moral responsibility, which we discussed when I was in Russia, and the concept of a person, and Gary Watson, all of those were written in the 60s and 70s. And uh, Nelson Pike's famous article about God and free will. And these articles on death, which were seminal articles by Thomas Nagel and Bernard Williams. So I never stopped thinking about those articles. And it's been interesting to see how there's been a lot of literature in the Anglo-American world on all of these articles or the issues that the philosophers tackle. And of course, I've always been interested in these big questions like free will and moral responsibility and death and immortality, meaning in life. <clears throat> and those are not questions that American philosophers and British philosophers traditionally wrote a lot about it. I'd say <clears throat> in philosophy, you find engagement with these literatures more in Europe and uh, in Russian literature, <laughs> with which I'm uh, somewhat familiar, but not enough. Um, and it's only relatively recently, starting in the late 60s and 70s, that Anglo-American philosophers started getting interested in, in these issues and writing about them. And there's even a, um, um, a thread or um, uh, you could say a group of philosophers called analytic existentialists. And so we're analytic philosophers who approach these uh, issues from a distinctive methodology of analytic philosophy, 
but we're tackling the issues that traditionally were only uh, written about by continental or European uh, philosophers. So, <clears throat> um, and I put in that group, Thomas Nagel, Bernard Williams, of course, passed away uh, not too long ago, but also Susan Wolf, uh, Shelley Kagan, uh, I would put myself in that camp and there are various others. And you could say that with the um, movement called logical positivism in Europe and uh, England, and to some extent, the United States in the uh, 20th century, in the early part of the 20th century, the idea was that <clears throat> you have to be very rigorous and everything has to be verifiable or perhaps falsifiable empirically in order to have meaning in order to be substantive. And <clears throat> certain areas of philosophy like ethics and aesthetics and metaphysics, for, for instance, various areas of metaphysics, philosophy of religion are not verifiable or falsifiable or do not issue in claims that are empirically testable. And therefore, as David Hume said, they should be consigned to the flames, or you, you, you really shouldn't do that kind of philosophy. But in the later part of the 20th century, things changed, and people did not necessarily accept a, any kind of verificationist understanding um, of um, or criterion for meaningfulness or acceptability of a philosophical claim. And um, it liberated philosophers to, to do ethics and philosophy of religion and metaphysics. And so now in the last 70 years or so, there's been a lot of work in uh, these areas. So I'm working in that tradition. And when I had my first job in uh, Connecticut, uh, in the Eastern part of the US at Yale University, I was asked to teach an introductory class and I'd never done that before, of course. And I thought, well, the students would be interested in free will and personhood and death and uh, life and death and perhaps immortality. So I, uh, I started teaching this material and I had a colleague and very close friend at Yale named Anthony Bruckner. <clears throat> and one day I was in my office preparing a lecture and he, he asked me what I was going to talk about. And I said, I was going to talk about Thomas Nagel's article. And I told him what I was going to say. And he said, ah, oh, but what about this? What about this? What about that? And he pointed out various interesting um, issues that I had been unaware of. And so we started conversations then. And, and, and they were particularly on the famous Lucretian um, mirror image argument. Um, Lucretius was a follower of Epicurus, Epicurus obviously in, in Greece and Epicurus in Rome, uh, but they both held this view that death cannot be bad for the deceased. It can be bad for others, you know, their loved ones or their family or people who care about them or rely on them, but not for the deceased. And that's because as Epicurus said, when death is, the person is not. And when the person is, death is not. There's no subject for the harm in question, the, the alleged harm. And <clears throat> further, he, and so there are various arguments for that, um, the claim that death can't be bad for the individual who dies. But one of them is the idea that there should be symmetric attitudes toward posthumous non-existence, i.e. death, and prenatal non-existence, i.e. the time before we were born or perhaps before we were conceived. <clears throat> because each of them, if you're secular and you assume that death is nothingness, that the individual goes out of existence and there are no further, there's no further existence or experiences, and that's a big assumption. But if you assume that, <clears throat> then metaphysically the time before you were born and the time after you're dead um, after you die are similar or the same they're uh, experiential blanks arguably deprivations of experiences you would have had but in any case they're indefinitely long experiential blanks in which you don't exist and since we're relatively indifferent 
to prenatal non-existence. We don't regret that we didn't exist in the year 1000 or, or whenever. We, uh, we should take a similar attitude of indifference or perhaps serenity toward our future non-existence. So we looked at that. That's a great arg argument. And that's something philosophers have been fascinated with and also uh, authors in literature, it's engaged a lot of people. <clears throat> and so we started trying to um, solve the problem or at least address the problem by invoking thought experiments from Dirk, uh, Derek Parfit. And so uh, you, you recall that I discussed those in the book, but that's what started, really got me interested when I was teaching at Yale. And, over the years, well, I came to the University of California, Riverside, and uh, Tony Bruckner came to UC Santa Barbara. Uh, so I'm in the desert and he was on the coast. But so we wrote a dozen articles together where we were following up. That's one of the nice things about Zoom, right? And cell phones is you can communicate and you can write together. And uh, we explored these issues sometimes in response to critiques of our paper our original paper called Why is Death Bad? And sometimes developing further articles. Unfortunately, uh, he did uh, pass away about uh, five years ago, I guess. Um, way too early, unfortunately. But um, we had hoped to write a book together, a uh, bringing together our work. Um, but we never had the chance to do that. And I I was thinking about, then I met uh, Derek Parfit at a conference in California and we were chatting and I said, well, you know, my colleague and I developed your work quite a lot and we really think well of it, but unfortunately he passed away and I, I was hoping to write a book. <laughs> Derek Parfit said, well, we should write it together. So I, I was very excited about that. And uh, we, were com we were corresponding and developing ideas. Then he died. <laughs> so I, I don't recommend that any of you agree to be my uh, co-author. That's probably, uh, you know, a jinx. But um, I don't want to make fun of it because it was, uh, it's obviously sad, uh, in my view, when someone dies, even if it's only for the rest of us. Um, so... I continue to think about these things, but that was one of the impetus. How do you, what's the plural of impetus? One of the reasons I chose uh, to write this book was I felt that I wanted to put that work together, but I didn't want it to be just rehashing and responding to critics. So that's one of the main reasons I wrote the book. But also in my teaching at Yale, I, I started thinking about Bernard Williams' paper almost everyone in analytic philosophy in the United States up until fairly recently agreed with Bernard Williams. He had a lot of students who were very influential. Uh, Shelley Kagan is one and a bunch of others. And um, they all agreed with him. Uh, Sam Scheffler, it was almost like a, a reflex, you know, like a knee jerk reaction. Uh, we agree with Bernard Williams, oh, immortality would be horrible and because it would be boring or you'd lose your character or your identity. Um, and so I kind of went along with that at first, but I also had this opposing thought that this seems crazy. I mean, really, are, are, is this really the case that we wouldn't choose to live much longer if we could? Um, is it really the case that after, you know, the main character in the play that uh, Bernard Williams focuses on, Alina Macropolis, it's in a famous play by Carol Kapek, made into an opera by uh, Janacek, so Czech authors, and uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And by the way, a little trivia, <clears throat> Carol Kapek was the first person to use the term robot. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, but in any case, um, they talked about this woman who was the daughter of a court physician in the uh, Middle Ages, and he had developed an elixir of eternal life. And she had taken it when she was 32, and now she's 332, because it gives you 300 years of medical immortality. And uh, she decides not to take it again. And uh, 
Williams argues it's because immortality would be necessarily boring. And she felt alienated from life and uh, not engaged. <clears throat> Everything is the same, she said. So <clears throat> that gave rise to an, a little industry of people agreeing with Williams. But I always thought this can't be right. So I, I did write a paper called Why Immortality is Not So Bad in the early 1980s, I think. And uh, I tried to take on some of those arguments. And I'm not saying my paper was the only reason why people started disagreeing with Williams. Of course, that's not the case. But there's now been a, a literature, fairly large, actually, in America and uh, Britain and Europe, trying to well, going back and forth, you could say, about Williams' idea that immortality would necessarily be bad. My view is it wouldn't necessarily be bad, of course. Uh, that would be bad under various circumstances, poverty, environmental devastation, uh, you know, bad health, body, <clears throat> body deteriorating or my mental illness. Yeah, I wouldn't wanna be immortal under those conditions. And a lot of people, I think, have a, an intuitive negative reaction to immortality because they extrapolate from elderly people with whom they're familiar. Some people live into their 90s, a few live into their when they're 100, and some of them are still psychologically vital and active and physically and mentally, and they, they do fine, but many if not most people who are living into their late 80s and 90s are significantly limited and some of them can't move around some of them lose their memories they have dementia of various sorts and it's not a pretty picture right and many of us know people perhaps parents grandparents friends uh parents of friends and so and spouses and we extrapolate we say i don't want to live that way my own mo mother is has dementia and she she's 90 almost 96 but the quality of her life is not high i think she still enjoys some moments and she still recognizes her children sometimes but uh, we can extrapolate and say i don't want to be like that if that's the way it would be to live forever i, I don't want to live i don't want to live 200 years if that's the way it's going to be but the philosophical thought experiment is different. Uh, the philosophical thought experiment that was raised in that play and opera and, and developed more fully by Bernard Williams is assume that we would have relatively favorable conditions. Uh, assume that we're not biologically aging and that, we, that our environment supports continued life and that we are um, physically and mentally well and so forth. We have good food and shelter. Assume all those. Why wouldn't you choose to live um, either forever or for more years? And that's where Bernard Williams says, no, necessarily. Eventually, you would become bored. Eventually, what he says is, with Alina, everything that could happen to an individual with a certain character has al already happened. And now it's all the same and boring. Um, and he claims it, that's true of any human being. So no human being should choose to take an elixir of life. You know, it goes back, uh, a liquid uh, is a theme in the immortality literature, going back to the fountain of youth, uh, people seeking an elixir of life. Um, and uh, Ponce de Leon, the story of Ponce de Leon, who was an explorer looking for the, um, the fountain of youth in the new world. And it turns out he, he did not discover the fountain of youth, but he did discover Florida. Uh, Florida is a place in the United States where many elderly people move because it's warm. And so many of them are still looking for the fountain of youth through anti-aging medicine and so forth. Okay, so that's why I started writing about these issues. Um, I have changed my views in some ways since I wrote the book. Uh, in most ways, I still hold the 
the, the main theses. Um, I sent a paper to Anton where I just, I explained some of the ways in which I've changed. So if you want to look at that, you can, but you know, that's optional. Uh, but we can talk about that. Um, I'm happy to discuss uh, some of the ways in which I've changed my view, but the main way and we can talk about it further if you'd like. Is in the book, I suggest that, first of all, that death, premature death, can be a bad thing for the individual who dies. I still hold that view based on the deprivation thesis. But I also, but very importantly, I distinguish following other people between looking, considering death as a bad thing for the individual and my considering my future death as potentially a bad thing for me. By that, I mean, not just the process of dying, but being dead, the status of being dead. I look at that as potentially a bad thing for me, if it's, as it were, premature, you know, and if I'm not in terrible pain and so forth. But I also said that we distinguish badness from fear and anxiety. And so even if my potential, my death would be potentially bad for me, doesn't follow that I should fear it or even have any negative psychological attitude toward it. <clears throat> but I still said in the book, nevertheless, I understand that distinction, but I still think it would be rational to some extent to fear being dead because Basically, nothingness is scary. Uh, that even though I recognize I wouldn't be in pain, remember, we're, we're assuming the secular view. Of course, if I, if I went to hell, then of course, uh, I would be suffering, but we're just putting that view aside for now. Um, even though I realize I wouldn't be tortured or suffering, I still can be afraid of going out of existence totally. Now, uh, I've changed my view of that, and I think um, the Epicurean is right that we should not fear the status of non-existence, that um, uh, we can still deem it a bad thing for me that I die prematurely, potentially a bad thing for others, but I should not fear or be anxious about specifically the status of non-existence or the, the status or state of being dead. Again, de uh, dying is different. When we use the word death, we could mean being dead or we could mean the process of dying or, or um, the end point of the process of dying. Um, that can be painful, that can be difficult. And I think near-death experiences provide um, a way of thinking about dying that's a little bit more humane. But um, I don't think we should fear the nothingness that is death. And uh, I was thinking in writing the book and my previous thinking that we are afraid of the unknown or we can be afraid of the unknown. And uh, nothingness or death what is the unknown. <laughs> but I've now come to the conclusion that there are reasons that are in favor of not being afraid of that being in that state. One way of putting it is it's not, it's not the unknown. Okay, it's nothingness. <laughs> and so we know what that will be like. It will be like nothing. Um, so... <clears throat> But in any case, so that's one way in which I've uh, changed my view. And uh, in that paper I sent to Anton, uh, for those of you who attended the summer program on moral responsibility and free will, and others who are interested, I try and make connections, or I do make connections <laughs> between um, the issues here in this literature on life and death and some of the issues in the moral responsibility literature. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. And I'm perfectly happy to engage with any questions you have, either about what I just said or about what's in the book or... Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, maybe someone have some brief clarification questions. Artyom Yashin, I see. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a brief uh, question concerning 
the truth conditions uh, of statements about meaning. So uh, suppose I say something like an activity A is quite meaningful. And then I have some good reasons to say that thing. Uh, and I think that uh, the social conventions are quite the same. So they coincide with my opinion about an activity A. Uh, and I'm mistaken. So uh, I think the social, the social conventions are like that, but actually uh, no one would support me. So am I mistaken about uh, meaningfulness of the activity? What would you say? I would say yes, <clears throat> um, but it might be important to distinguish conventional morality from, or conventional ideas from what's sometimes called critical morality um, <clears throat> or critical analysis where you are stepping outside what you admit is the consensus. But so this is an excellent question is, there are areas of philosophy in which we can't apply the empirical verificationist or falsificationist idea, we just can't. And in ethics, <clears throat> one of the movements that have, has been important was represented by John Rawls, a theory of justice, and a whole group then of philosophers who adopted what he called uh, the method of uh, reflective equilibrium. And what that meant is you present, um, you, you think about an issue and then you present intuitions or considered judgments about the issue. Then you try and systematize those judgments by identifying general principles. And then you test the general principles by other intuitions. And uh, you eventually get or seek, or the goal is a reflective equilibrium, an equilibrium or homeostasis, a match between your general principles and your specific intuitions. The intuitions could be considered social convention or conventional ideas. <clears throat> some of them come from social conventions. Some of them might come from your religious views or just from your reflection. Now, um, that's been broadened in recent years by so-called X5 or experiment philosophy, experimental philosophy, where people think you shouldn't just invoke your own intuitions from the armchair, but you should do polls and uh, try and figure out what people in general in your society feel. And then you try, you could use those intuitions as your data points. But so I don't want to go on too long. The direct answer to your question is if you use this methodology, uh, a coherence methodology or wide uh, reflective equilibrium, then it, you make statements and you think that that's the test of the statement is whether it fits with your intuitions in reflective equilibrium, you could be wrong. If you say, cutting or counting the blades of grass on my front lawn every day to make sure it's the same or to figure out whether they are more or fewer, that's meaningful. And if you accept that methodology, you will be wrong, uh, wrong relative to your own social conventions or to that starting point. But if you explicitly say, I know that the social convention says blah, 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 but I disagree with that, then uh, you can't say straightforwardly that you're wrong. You have described yourself then as going in your own direction, and you could call that a critique of social morality. And I don't know how to assess it as whether whether it's true or false. You just might say, okay, I don't, we can't empirically verify or falsify what you said. We can't use the uh, method of reflective equilibrium because you explicitly say you're not doing that. So I guess what I'll have to do is listen to you and take it as a challenge to my reflective equilibrium. Um, but I can't really assess what you're saying as true or false. Okay, that's the way I would think of it. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.
And now we are going to the discussion part of our seminar. Uh, so, Professor Fischer, uh, right now our participants will uh, take their speeches one by one, and then you will uh, have the time for uh, replies. Uh, so, we will start with uh, Oksana Cherkashina. Dear Professor Fisher, I'm very glad to see you. Uh, I've been thinking about them for the later several months, and suddenly I received that invitation to this discussion, so it was just like... And my first, uh, not one of the first um, reactions from the book, so here is why Plum killed White, now, now we know. He killed her for protecting him from experience. So among all the intellectual adventures of the book and of the essay, I found most impressive two things. First is that part of the essay that um, says about changing ideas about the fear of death because of your personal uh, experience of a surgery. And I really liked it because it is a conclusion where reason meets personal experience. And I kind of beginning reading the book, I expected to see some, some experience. So but this is one of the rare parts of the book where experience is involved and it doesn't concentrate on spiritual things as we know so it, this is important for the reader to understand that uh, from the very beginning and i was thinking how this book should be understood in general uh, understood and um, i think it should be understood as purely intellectual and sc scholar as grief management that it wouldn't do but uh, surprisingly to me, it seems to be a good book for terror management, although I'm guessing it wasn't meant like that. Uh, it's uh, good in a way that it makes you think through all of your um, ideas of death and, well, maybe unconscious beliefs about death. And I found that uh, my personal impression is that uh, Miro argument is, is working. It's perfectly all right to believe that if that's not a problem that I was born one day, it's all okay that I would die one day. So this is very thought provoking. And I would like to mention one more such thought, <laughs> provocative. It was on page 71 of the electronic edition. Uh, here you say on any plausible approach to personal identity, it is impossible to be born earlier but then it's provoking a question what approaches are plausible then i'm not only substance substance approach is not plausible by this view right uh, you couldn't even accept animalism uh, because if one is made from the same uh, dna but earlier which is not impossible uh, there would still be the same organism and then mm, by animalism account a person could be born earlier so then why not why isn't this plausible but that's just one thought basically what impressed me most uh, to those things first is uh, experience and uh, thoughts of that experience and second is classifying people into optimists, realists, and um, not pessimists, but what they were called badgers, badgers. So it's a label that I find difficult to accept because it, because it's unpleasant. People with different opinions don't have to be that they just have different opinions. And you could guess that it is also my opinion that physical immortality is not a good thing. Certainly not to me. Because, and it is not because it's boring, that's, that's the last worry I would have, but because there are not only biological, but also social flaws in question that would make it a torture. If immortality would be on Earth, then implementation of it into the society would follow the general laws of human societies. And it would be bad because, uh, because of the social laws, because it wouldn't be angels to distribute medical immortality. It would be up, up to authorities to manage the question of who is immortal and under what conditions. And this part could be still all right, although 
I wouldn't want myself to be immortal while my, while my beloved one is not. But there is another social law which comes into action here. In practice, medical immortality can invade real immortality. Just give a couple of criminal laws that tell not to commit suicide or your family will be punished. And that's it. You've got uh, real immortality as a torture. And then come on all the wars of real immortality, such as endless suffering and having to see endless wars. It's scary that authorities would have an ultimate weapon worse than anything possible. And I would say that immortality may be all right for a philosopher in peaceful land, and may your land be peaceful and blessed forever but something universally desirable for any person in any country. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Now I give a microphone to Artem Besedin, please. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, John, for this wonderful, fascinating book. Uh, this really great philosophical work. And uh, in, in, in many respects, in a few, in a few, Respects. It is. Um, it is a very good uh, and excellent uh, philosophical uh, book. Uh, first of all, uh, all of us know that the books on the death and the meaning of life are uh, the, the main books on the uh, philosophy shelves in the bookstores. But usually, uh, professional philosophers simply cannot digest this uh, literature. It is it is very far from uh, normal normal philosophy, and it is uh, great that uh, your book uh, deals with such a popular on one hand, and a very difficult and uh, tr a traditional philosophical uh, question, and in such a, such a good and uh, manageable way. And this book is very good a demonstration of the progress in philosophy, as I think, because we can say that uh, the question of life and death is one of the oldest philosophical questions. And uh, on, at the same time, uh, we cannot today treat this question uh, in the same way as Lucretius did or ancient uh, other ancient philosophers did, uh, simply because the world has changed. Uh, so we cannot directly apply the reasoning to our life today. And uh, when the world changes, our our uh, philosophy must change as well. And this is uh, at least a basic kind of uh, progress in philosophy. But on the other hand, you uh, pay a lot of attention to this, uh, the classical arguments of Epicureans, of Lucretius. And uh, that is a very deep and uh, uh, persuasive analysis of this argumentation. Um, conceptual analytic analysis, I mean, it is not a kind of a historical analysis that can take uh, the whole book uh, of hundreds and hundreds of pages, but uh, very persuasive and interesting uh analysis and it can be the same can be said can be said about many other things so this book is uh, uh really important as a, a comprehensive introduction into the philosophical arguments about uh life death and, immor and immortality if uh, you want to get the impression of the uh field to and get acquainted with the problem this is the best the best choice uh, anyway and um, i personally like uh, your idea of realism uh, that is that can be accepted as a motto uh, for philosophers let us be realistic uh, we can uh, we can uh, sketch some optimistic uh, options, some pessimistic options, but anyway, the best commonsensical uh, route uh, will be uh, realism about any phenomenon. And that is uh, that is surprising that still up to now there, the realism about immortality and uh, well, and about this near death exp experience was not on the table. 
So we have become realistic about immortality. Uh, only now. Uh, and this is again a feature, a progress, a feature of the progress of the progress in our, in our philosophical reasoning. I personally uh, like your Frankfurt style examples about experience shield. Uh, that is, uh, I think that it's a deeply, deeply personal, uh, deeply personal feature of your, of your book. And uh, I find. Uh, I find your chapter, your, the part of the book that uh, is uh, that uh, is concerned with uh, the effects of immortality on our life, uh, very very interesting. But now I want to suggest some criticism and uh, questions. Uh, what what I think would be also interesting the influence of uh, immortality. Uh, the analysis of the influence of immortality on the philosophical problems uh, that it can be interesting for us as philosophers. For example, you discussed Parfit, and for me, uh, it would be interesting to know what would be your reaction to the intergenerational justice, to the, uh, the, to the questions of the intergenerational justice, to the, uh, to the non-identity problem and uh, the related things. And you mentioned Rawls, so Rawls also discusses uh, the inter intergenerational justice. So it seems that we simply cannot formulate this uh, problem anymore if uh, we uh, if we discuss it in the context of uh, immortality, at least uh, if almost everybody is immortal, medically immortal, right? Uh, uh, some more some more criticism. It seems seems to me that uh, you are skeptical about the um, meaning in life, meaning in the virtual life, or maybe it is not true. Uh, but that's my impression after reading your book. And recently we uh, discussed uh, the ideas of Chalmers, who will publish uh, the book on virtual reality in the next year and his ideas are opposite so he thinks that we can live our full lives in uh, uh, we, we can live normal lives in the virtual reality meaningful lives and it is it seems quite persuasive to me that uh, now for example now we can, it can it can appear that uh, we are all in the matrix and we for all this for all, for all our life we uh, were plugged in some matrix and uh, it doesn't seem to me that our life will be pointless after after we know after we recognize this uh, fact uh, it, it seems that you are that you uh, defend some kind of narrativism but i didn't get uh, the idea narrativism about what you, you discussed the life stories but it seems that you are not a narrativist about personal identity you discussed thin self big self and then you um, then you apply this uh, idea of storytelling when you discuss the near-death exper experience by the end of the book so uh, what what are the narratives and uh, what is the narrativism about in your case? And finally, finally, uh, I'm very glad that I met the discussion of revolutionary uh, features of uh, near death experience in your uh, in your book because oh, <laughs> for the most part I waited I expected where is the evolution after all in, in this discussion it, it, it appears in the second in the second half in the second half of the book but uh you discuss the evolutionary aspects of the near-death experience but you do not discuss uh, the evolutionary aspects of uh immortality itself so uh cannot we apply similar logic uh what more do you, I forgot this architectural element that you uh, use in as a, use an example? Uh, can that we apply the same uh, logic to uh, our desire for mortality, the evolutionary logic? I mean, uh, so 
that's my reaction to your uh, wonderful book and my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Artyom. Uh, next is uh, Artyom Yashin. Yeah. So I'd like to thank uh, Professor Fisher for this uh, book. I don't think it's dreadful at all, actually. It deals with some serious existential questions, but at the same time, it is very polite. It holds the distance masterfully, I think. Uh, and it's quite unlike Russian literature, for example, uh, which tries to pierce you <laughs> and uh, to, uh, to submerge you into existential dread, etc. At least uh, for me, it worked that way. So uh, I liked a, a, quite a few ideas. So uh, I found uh, a couple of thoughts insightful, for example, um, death as double deprivation. And um, I thought about it, that's quite a neat uh, formula and uh, a way of thinking about death and deprivation. And also uh, how naturalism tries to situate awe and not to eliminate it. That's just like, I don't know, a, a motto or a slogan, and you can use it as a slogan of naturalism. Um, so um, there is uh, an element uh, in your uh, discussion of uh, immortality in afterlife that I found lacking, perhaps, or, or not. Maybe you, you don't think this idea is interesting. Uh, for me, the most uh, attractive or the most uh, interesting way of discussing afterlife is uh, death uh, as uh, something that opens uh, some uh, new opportunities or opens some transformations in our nature uh, that we cannot imagine at the moment. So for example, in uh, Orthodox theology, uh, there is a term uh, theosis. So what is uh, theosis? Well, I don't really uh, know what it is. I don't have proper education and I'm not even religious, but well, I've read something about this. Uh, theosis implies uh, some transformations of nature or participation in uh, God's energy. So it's not just about mystical experience in afterlife or about some connection with God. It's about preserving the thin person while uh, completely transforming the thick person or even, I don't know, evaporizing it. Uh, so uh, hu after death, uh, a human being becomes something more and there is some radical novelty uh, which we cannot access now and we cannot imagine that novelty. And uh, you um, uh, invoke fiction a lot of times in uh, your book and uh, the fictional uh, thing I've thought of uh, while I was reading your passages about how immortal beings could live with mortal beings like Silicon Valley billionaires and us commoners uh, I thought about J.R.R. Tolkien and about uh, the elves who live together with men. So uh, Tolkien discusses uh, death uh, in The Lord of the Rings and in The Silmarillion, and I think in The Silmarillion even more than in the former. Uh, and so elves are essentially immortal. They uh, live as long as the world exists and men are mortal. And uh, men have a gift from God, namely death. So death as a gift. Uh, that's how the elves call it. That's how uh, men used to call it in this universe. Uh, why is death a gift? Well, because God has a plan for humans uh, of this radical transformation or something else of uh, uh, participation in a new creation myth or something along these lines. Uh, so after death, humans are destined to become something more than they are in this world and to get out of the world. Whereas elves uh, are essentially an in-world creatures. So they are immortal and they live in, un in the universe, but they are confined by the universe. Whereas men are not and they are not confined thanks to death, uh, which lets them free uh, in the end. Uh, and uh, well, I think this idea of uh, afterlife is uh, the most attractive or at least, uh, well, I don't know uh, how, um, 
it's not like pleasurable, but it's uh, at least it it uh, summons some uh, intuitions about novelty. So we like novel things, we like new things. So and it promises us a lot of new things somehow. So uh, yes, uh, I think this point would be uh, quite interesting because um, um, central pleasures in afterlife, uh, like uh, literary uh, interpretation of the Quran or uh, the Bible, uh, that's like, well, this idea exists, but um, among uh, some serious theologically enlightened people, I think it's more of an exception of this idea of uh, central pleasures. Uh, so yes, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Artyom. Uh, now, Eugene Loginov. Um, uh, thank you, Professor, for uh, your book and the opportunity to um, read it and the opportunity to discuss it. I've had a fascinating time with your text, uh, and it is exactly uh, the kind of philosophy I, I enjoy the most that is uh, dialectical uh, in uh, ancient uh, Greek sense of the word. And at the same time, it is about, uh, you know, existential uh, question and uh, discussion is uh, mm, very fruitful. I strongly support your uh, desire to explore the meaning uh, of life from the uh, secular point of view, secular uh, perspective. And I like your uh, ideas of um, immortality. I find them uh, really um, attractive and um, convincing. What you say about uh, zoom um, out and zoom in uh, arguments um, are very um, refreshing. Uh, I want you. Uh, I want to ask you um, about three particular uh, points you make uh, in the book. Um, I'm going to present one uh, counter argument on something like that. Uh, and two things which uh, I did not uh, understand uh, during the reading. So the first is, um, the first, um, what I'm going to say is that before uh, I read your text, I was uh, uh, all my philosophical life um, convinced by uh, Hippocarianism about death. So I will concentrate uh, on this topic. I consider um, this piece of reasoning uh, as a rather solid one, and uh, one is a few deep uh, philosophical arguments, which I have known from the history of philosophy that uh, really uh, can help me in life. Uh, but uh, you have shown, and uh, uh, your argumentation is uh, sound, I think, that uh, Hippocarianism um, about this may, may um, have an, an attractive uh, commitment. Mm, let me try to defend what I uh, used to believe in. Uh, you say that mm, Hippocarian about this should claim uh, the weak connection uh, between badness and uh, negative experience because of the, the betrayal case. And then you attack this claim by uh, your Frankfurt uh, style argument, uh, the, the scheduled uh, betrayal um, case. The argument presents a case when uh, there is something bad happening to a person uh, without even a possibility uh, that the person feels uh, the harm or knows about it. This is a very good and very, very interesting move. But let me try to answer it. The uh, Epicurean in response may say that mm, there is uh, still mm, something, uh, uh, there, there is some difference between uh, shadow betrayal case and non-existence uh, after, after death. Uh, you, ca you have explored the, yes, the uh, position uh, that mm, the person in the shadow betrayal case is not harmed. But uh, Hippocarian may make another move. Uh, he may agree that there is some harm in this case. Then he may ask, why do we think that person in, uh, in this case is harmed? And the answer, I think, that, uh, will be that this person is living in a lie. I think you presuppose something like uh, that. And uh, this person's uh, her uh, supposed friends by betrayal made her uh, beliefs about uh, her life false. She believes, for example, th that she lives lovely life uh, and uh, that beliefs are completely 
uh, false uh, because of her supposed friend's uh, betrayal. And when uh, one person makes another person's uh, belief false in such a dramatic way, it may be considered as a causing harm uh, without hurting someone's uh, uh, feelings. But after death, I will not have any beliefs to make false. So I will not be capable for being harmed in uh, this particular way in which the person in the scheduled betrayal case is harmed. So what do you, do you think about this line uh, of um, defense? This is my uh, counterexample, and uh, then I will brief point to one, the two, uh, two topics which I didn't um, fall uh, in exact way. So. My second question is about the stroke case. I mm, just don't get how exactly from the description of the case is followed that the individual can't uh, experience anything negative. Uh, you say that the person is reduced to the mental condition of the infant, but from, the, from what does it follow that the infant can't be harmed and experience pain, for example? I see your point here in general, but this particular detail I uh, didn't get. Uh, if you explain it to me, uh, it will be uh, great and very useful for me. And the last one, I didn't understand how exactly uh, your perfect style response works. Uh, it shows that uh, mm, we have different attitudes towards the future and the past. We prefer, uh, the ple uh, we prefer pleasure in future and we prefer to leave suffering in past. That's clear. Um, it is uh, some kind of asymmetry between past, uh, the past and the future. I, I agree. But I don't understand how this type of asymmetry affects the relation between uh, prenatural and uh, posthumous non existence. Any non existence, uh, as I see, mm, means that there is nothing. Uh, to suffer or nothing to have uh, some pleasure. So I don't see the line of reasoning uh, here in an exact way. Uh, so this is my question. Thank you very much to, for, for the opportunity to ask and uh, to read your book. It was very interesting. Yeah, thank you very much, Eugen. Now the microphone is passing to me. Uh, Professor Fischer, thank you very much again yeah, for your book. It's a wonderful book. It's, it was really a pleasure to read it. And uh, there were a lot of questions you raised that I've never thought about in my life. And uh, this week, <laughs> uh, I was thinking about them. It was wonderful. Thank you for this opportunity. But my main uh, worries were about uh, your concept of uh, the meaning in life. Uh, because I, I, um, my worry is that uh, either I do not understand understood it correctly, or uh, there could be such uh, some problems uh, connecting with uh, this notion and your um, your conception of uh, free will. I mean, um, there are two conditions of the meaning in life. Uh, you uh, point to these uh, non delusory connection to reality and freedom. So it seems that only persons can have a meaningful life. One who is not a person cannot be free, so he cannot construct his life narrative by his deeds. And uh, for me, uh, there seems two uh, strange things to worry. First of all, uh, it seems it means that human beings that are not uh, persons cannot have a meaningful life. So, for example, a life of a child who died young or a life of a man with hard mental disease that make him impossible to act freely seems to be meaningless. Uh, well, maybe that is not bad. Maybe that is all right, since you disconnect the meaning in life from happiness, from morality, from many other valuable things. Uh, so to say that someone's life is meaningless is not to say that it is not worth living, that it, is, uh, it has no value, etc. It is just to say that uh, it is better to live as a person than non-person. So uh, if this understanding of mine is correct, it 
would be wonderful. Uh, but then there goes the second worry. Uh, it's about the um, free will. Uh, as far as I remember your uh, conception of free will, it requires at least uh, the, for an agent to be free, uh, he needs to have a guidance control and a reason responsiveness mechanism that should be correctly attributed to him, that should not be alienated from him. And so you argue uh, that it requires guidance and not regulative control. Uh, and principle of the alternative possibilities has nothing to do with moral responsibility and meaning in life. So we can be free persons and try to meaningful narrative of our lives by our actions without regulative control. And in your deep control book, another book, you illustrated arguing against the proponents of the conditional notion of freedom. Uh, who assume that for an agent to be free, there should be a suitable connection between what she choose to do and what she actually did. Uh, so you're arguing uh, against it, relying on Frankfurt style example and modifying it in such a way that an agent choice can be a triggering event for a black who interrupts uh, its realization. So if an agent, an agent uh, will make a choice that Black don't like, he will interrupt and uh, preclude its realization. And in that case, an agent obviously will not be free and morally responsible for his uh, acts. But uh, in the opposite case, if the agent uh, make a choice that satisfies Black, he will not interrupt. And so the agent uh, will um, make his deeds according to his own uh, will. So he will be uh, free and responsible agents, uh, even if he uh, had no possibility to, to act otherwise. But now, uh, what is my um, worry comes from? Imagine two agents that are indistinguishable in, their, in uh, how they act. Can it be the case that uh, in between two lives with the same chronicle of life, one life will have a narrative and another one will not have a narrative. So one will, uh, one agent will live a meaningful life and another uh, will not. Uh, it seems that it could happen uh, if, for example, these two agents uh, will be monitored by Black in every choice they make, uh, but the first agent will act accordingly the will of Black. His choice every time will satisfy Black and Black will not interrupt. So the first agent every time will make a free and responsible act uh, and live a meaningful life and be a free, being a free agent. And another person, uh, another agent, another agent will uh, every time make the opposite choice. And so uh, Black will not like it. And so Black will interrupt each time. And so the second agent will not be free, uh, but still he will every time act like the first agent. So their chronicles of life will be indistinguishable, but the first one will be the free person and live meaningful life. And the second will not. Um, I'm not sure that there is no contradiction in uh, such picture, since uh, I have a guess, I have no time yet, uh, just brief remark, I have a guess that uh, in such kind of cases we do not need Black as an uh, external uh, interrupter. Uh, we can imagine uh, such cases with a kind of um, inverse acrasia, uh, like Norma Apale uh, imagining. Uh, versa Crozier is kind of making good good thing, thinking that they are bad things. Uh, so we can imagine uh, two people who act uh, indistinguishable, but one uh, person is leading uh, with his best judgments, and so is uh, totally reason uh, responsive, responsive. And another one uh, makes the opposite. He acting badly every time, understanding that he acting badly, uh, he is acting 
not according to his best judgment, then maybe he's not free, and then his his life is uh, meaningless. So, uh, summarizing, my question is: Could there be a case uh, where the chronicles of life are indistinguishable, but one of the life is meaningful and not, another one is meaningless? And is it a problem? Uh, thank you very much. I will pass the microphone to Anna Anatolina Kostikova, please. Nice to see you and uh, thank you very much uh, to the opportunity to see you uh, and uh, to discuss the wonderful uh, the wonderful books. Thank you again and uh, I'd like uh, to thank you precisely for some things that I, I, I hope that I understood finally. First of all, that's a book about uh, the meaning, uh, not, not, not meaning itself, but the meaning of, of the life. Uh, so, because I wonder uh, if all analytical uh, philosophy finally <laughs> go to this question uh, about the meaning of the life, and uh, we, we find the answer because uh, you write after all historical arguments uh, were wonderful presented and very interesting, especially for me. Uh, the re refocused presentation of different analytical point points of view. So that's very, uh, very fruitful um, fragments uh, through all the text. But uh, finally, we, 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 we find the answer that the meaning of the life is coming from uh, the free will and uh, the moral responsibility and that we are imperfect and all this question it's not about the static state but uh, about dynamic state and that it's a question with uh, the chime but if we agree with this uh, appointment we, we m maybe I'm wrong but I have so some special question about oh, why do not death itself could be functionally good as a part of guidance for the free will and the moral responsibility. Because in uh, a lot of existential ideas about uh, life and death, uh, we find the idea that the death itself is working for the meaning of the life. Maybe through some other instruments that we can precise then we can present as uh, a narrative uh, story, as a life story, as a process of storytelling. But uh, that's the idea that it's a mechanism uh, for this uh, dy dynamic status uh, being alive. So maybe it's uh, the key to universalize uh, all the experiments you go through and you compare in the book in uh, some, I, as, I, as, as I saw, uh, hierarchical meaning, uh, the medical death, the afterlife experience, the near-death experience. Maybe we, we can find something universal for this experience. It's all uh, something about boundary experience. And in uh, the European tradition, uh, Maybe Russian tradition, we celebrate uh, uh, this autumn uh, the 200th anniversary of Dostoevsky, who wrote a lot uh, about death, uh, moral agency, <laughs> and responsibility, and all pr problems uh, involved in the subject. But uh, that's uh, also the idea how uh, our death and our meaning of life are presented for others, uh, so uh, how we performed the meaning of our lives. Uh, so that's also a crucial, uh, a crucial thing maybe to discuss, because it's uh, not only about uh, the experience, and uh, uh, somebody said that maybe uh, we can become philosopher only after uh, the experience of death, of some kind of boundary experience. 
only after this we uh, we receive uh, this experience of uh, self guidance. Uh, so that's uh, one of uh, of the part of idea. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe here we uh, find something in addition to uh, uh, this uh, story of uh, personal uh, meaning of of the life of the agency theory. However, it was a wonderful experience for me and. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for your strong position. Uh, and uh, as we, we, we can see, finally, an optimistic one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Anatolina. Anton Kuznetsov, please. Uh, John, again, thank you very much uh, for being here. And um, uh, it's nice to see you. And um, thank you much for your book. I, I should um, confess that I started to uh, study philosophy from religious Russian philosophy. And since that time, uh, I've been avoiding uh, these topics because it, it just uh, looked to me that, that not very good to discuss in rational uh, way. And, the last book um, I read, uh, the book which uh, has in its title Meaning in Life, was a, a book by Dirk Peribom. <laughs> so, and, and, and it, indeed, it's quite uh, different from your book. I like to join to what um, Artem Besedin said that I really enjoyed uh, your realistic attitude and uh, com common sense especially to like something like co connected to virtual world and it, that it is uh, really needed to be in a real world and uh, so other very very interesting things and i see many interesting questions uh, uh, already have been raised and uh, i just uh, in this situation, I just want to ask you one question. So it is about the end of the world. And you uh, didn't uh, uh, discuss it in, in your book, but it, it's quite interesting uh, how um, the notion of the inevitable end of the world um, is connected to Immortal, immortality and badness of death because uh, in case of the end of the world so it seems uh, there is nothing about future good experiences bad experiences and so on and so forth so it's it's quite interesting uh, how immortality relates to end of the world issue and could we say that end of the world is bad in the same way as the death. So thank you very much. And I really, really enjoyed your book. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anton. And Vadim Valerich Vasilev, please. Thank you very much. I'm glad to participate in this very interesting discussions. Mm, there are many deep and interesting arguments and ideas in your John book and the paper which you also mm, recommended. I would like to make a comment on just one of your claims. That is uh, on the claim that there is no general meaning of human life. You believe it is so, there is no such general meaning. That's why you discuss the meaning in life, but not meaning of life. But look at the topic of uh, the meaning of life. Le let's start with a question, not about people and their lives, but about their smartphones. Look, is the existence of smartphones meaningless? Again, is the existence of uh, people's smartphones meaningless? Surely not. Smartphones exist for certain reasons. They are designed to help us 
uh, in communication, uh, entertainment, and so on. Uh, the goals they, smartphones, help us to achieve give meaning to their existence. Note that these goals are quite objective. Now, why can't we look at the human beings in the same way? We are designed by natural selection to achieve some uh, objective goals. Of course, we can argue uh, about their content, but not about their existence, if you accept evolution. And this uh, theory of evolution, and these goals make objective goals, uh, for which we were designed by evolution, make our existence meaningful. These goals that is compose the meaning of our lives. Uh, Moreover, one of these goals, for example, is obvious enough to procreate and guide. You talk many interesting things on guidance and guide our children, to procreate and guide our children in the first years of their life. That's a quite an objective goal. And uh, that is, uh, and this is a meaning, one of the meaning of human life, if I am correct in my previous reasoning. Uh, and I, honestly, I am not quite sure why such an argument doesn't convince you. You refer to Susan Wolf, uh, um, as far as I remember, uh, uh, when you deny the meaning of human life. But anyway, I would like to hear your comments on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vadim Valerievich. And now, Professor Fischer, it's your time to answer. I know there were a lot of the were different uh, questions. Uh, anyone on, of us uh, at any time can remind you uh, what our questions were about, but please take your time for the reply. Okay, I'm trying to, was Oksana the first? Yes. Okay, okay, good. So, all, I should just say, I thank all of you for reading so carefully and for even reading the extra paper I sent. Uh, very much appreciate that. And also, um, thank you for your excellent questions. Thank you for your generous and very nice comments. I appreciate that. And also uh, for your probing uh, questions. I appreciate some of them I'll have to think more about. They're not easy to answer. Um, Let's just go back to the um, to Epicurus and um, and Lucretius, the um, post uh, the Hellenic philosophers in general, uh, the Stoics and the Epicureans. They looked at philosophy as therapeutic. Um, Martha Nussbaum has an interesting book called *The Therapy of Desire*, and it's about the Stoics and the Epicureans and how they looked at philosophical questions and tried to use reason to diffuse our worries and anxieties. So it was a deliberately therapeutic approach to philosophy. Let's get rid of our anxieties about death by thinking about it more clearly. And my approach wasn't intentionally <clears throat> therapeutic. That is, my intention was to look at the issues analytically and let them go wherever they go. And I would conclude, uh, I would form views eventually based on the logic and not on an intention to be, um, to calm our anxieties or worries. So I thought of myself as approaching it somewhat differently from the um, therapeutic model. But I agree that in the end, some of the conclusions I come to could be used as part of an overall terror management strategy, a secular terror management strategy. So religious views posit an afterlife um, in which it's possible that we have a good existence, the best of all possible existences in communion with God in some way, um, maybe transformed, um, uh, but 
um, it's a better kind of existence and maybe we'll be reunited with loved ones. But the terror management of a secular approach is different. Uh, it doesn't posit an afterlife, but it presents the idea that since we wouldn't exist, we won't suffer at all. And that can be combined with uh, lessons of the near-death experiences and other um, lessons to the effect that we can die in more humane ways. So the status of being dead, dead and the process of dying can be looked at without fear. And uh, so that's, I agree that though it wasn't my intention, some of the conclusions are helpful in a terror management strategy. And I also agree that so the philosophical discussion has been abstract. Um, and we what one thing that's striking is how, if you look back at uh, Bernard Williams article that was published in 1975, Thomas Nagel's discussions, he in his famous article, Death, he doesn't really discuss immortality, but in subsequent work, he talks about immortality. And he's one of the people who disagrees with Bernard Williams. He, um, he thinks, as he says, uh, that if medicine advances to the point where we could be immortal, he would not be bored. There would be all sorts of activities and adventures. And as he said, I think I would manage. I think I could manage. And um, all of this discussion up till recently has been in a vacuum or abstract, and it has not attended to environmental pressures and environmental degradation and how that might relate. Now, Martha Nussbaum and some others have made points similar to Anna's, um, Oksana's points about how um, immortality would, you know, almost necessarily lead to environmental pressures and uh, the environment as we think of it now couldn't really support <clears throat> extreme longevity or uh, some extreme form of um, longevity, uh, immortality. <clears throat> so th those are questions that are real, political questions, social, environmental questions. And if you, if you envisaged immortality as a real option, you'd have to address those problems. An optimist would say, eventually we'll, we will be able to figure out ways to coordinate socially and politically and that science will advance to the point where we'll be able to use resources more efficiently or not uh, pillage the earth's uh, resources that's very optimistic it's not a view that i hold i am very concerned and as we see as life goes on we see the political leaders struggling to come to grips with this. We see more environmental degradation. So I don't think it's really realistic to suppose that we will be able to achieve significantly greater longevity. I mean, we could maybe figure out how to live to 100 or even 120, maybe even a bit longer. But to imagine that we could live indefinitely for, or for thousands of years, as in medical immortality, um, and that we could have children, for instance, um, that would just be um, un, unrealistic. But what I would say is, uh, so the, one thing that's interesting is to see how philosophers back in the mid 70s didn't worry about these issues at all. Now, we did, the human beings started being interested in environmental uh, concerns in the 70s and Earth Day started, I recall, uh, in the 70s. But over the years, the problems have just got worse and worse and more pressing. So you can't really ignore them now. But what I just wanted to say is, it's a sad thing and striking that the world was in good enough shape back in the 1970s that we didn't have to worry about that. It didn't even strike uh, people like Nagel and Williams that this would be a problem. So it's kind of a sad commentary as to what's happened in the last uh, 50 years. Um, 
But I would distinguish the more abstract philosophical question from the more practical question. And both are extremely important. The practical question is probably more important, but as philosophers, we can kind of consider hypotheticals. And Bernard Williams, when I home in on Williams' art, art, argument, it has nothing to do with environmental issues. It's about assuming that those are still, that our environment would support us. Um, what he argues is there's something essential to human nature, which is such that um, immortality would not be worthy of choice. Our nature, our identities would unravel and that's uh, that's what he's worried about. Okay, so um, though there there more there's more to all of your your questions and your comments, but I have to just kind of select some. Um, there were two Artems, but we started with Artem uh, Besedin. You had the very uh, excellent questions. Uh, one question was um, looking at Derek uh, Parfit and John Rawls. They discuss intergenerational justice, John Rawls, and also uh, both of them discuss it. And uh, Parfit especially focuses on the non-identity problem. How would immortality have an effect on these issues? And I think if we don't allow in our thought experiment that the immortal people will have children, there will not be an issue of intergenerational justice or the non you know, the non-identity problem does go away. Um, if we assume that the immortal people can have children, um, maybe they're only medically immortal, and so eventually there will be a cycling through of generations, then the same problems will arise. Um, and I don't have any specific way of answering the problems. I, uh, But you're right. I think if we are all immortal and we can figure out how the environment could sustain that and we don't have children, then the intergenerational justice problem goes away. So that might be a nice thing about uh, immortality, at least from a philosophical uh, perspective. Then um, fascinating question about Chalmers and others who think, in fact, we could all be in a matrix now, we could all be in a simulation. As you know, Chalmers takes that argument, that possibility very seriously. I think he thinks that it's probable that we are all in a simulation. And um, Nick Bostrom, the Oxford philosopher has been very influential in, in proposing this possibility. The idea is, uh, you know, we're getting very sophisticated uh, in artificial intelligence, but there are, you know, billions of planets out there and the likelihood is that there's some more sophisticated uh, species than ours and that they've been around uh, and they have been developing more sophisticated um, artificial intelligence, let's say. And some of them have created simulations or there are many simulations, we're in one of them. Um, could we lead a meaningful life? Um, I don't know. Uh, I follow uh, Robert Nozick in his famous experience machine, and he met, let's say you are involuntarily and even without your knowledge hooked into an experience machine, which is like a matrix type situation. Um, and what he argues is, you know, you, you would be living a lie. You wouldn't want your child to, to be hooked up in this way. Uh, all your beliefs about the external world are false. Now, it's very complicated how to analyze these situations, but um, my view is one, th one important thing is to distinguish subjective from objective meaning. I mean, subjectively, the life, a virtual life or a life in a matrix uh, or a simulation could be meaningful, but now, is there an objective notion of meaningfulness where the universe is the, you know, there are individuals in the universe creating these simulations and we are in a simulation? I just don't know. I mean, I, I would, just to be honest, I don't know how I feel about those issues. Um, so I do think just apart from the wild thought experiment that we're all in an experience machine or we're all brains in a vat 
being stimulated by alien creatures or we're all in a simulation. I mean, I actually take these very seriously in my epistemology. I actually uh, don't think we can know that we're not brains in a vat or in a simulation. That doesn't mean that we can't, that we should act, that we shouldn't act as if we aren't. Um, but I don't know what I think about whether such lives would be in some objective sense meaningful. I just don't know. Uh, so it's a good question I, I'd have to think about. But my own intuition is that judgments and evaluations of scenarios about and asking questions about meaningfulness, it might be like personal identity that the concepts are built for the real world uh, as we think of it. And once you depart from the, the world as we conceptualize it and try and apply concepts like meaningfulness or personal identity or even right or right and wrong, um, at some point you you can't because the concept works for us because we live in a world of a certain sort or we think we live in a world of a certain sort and it doesn't apply or it, it can't be extended, but I don't know. So that's a good question. Um, I would agree that the drive for immortality, yeah, but I think they, there are at least two drives or concerns that are very basic, a fear of death and a drive for immortality. And they're related, but they're not the same. Uh, we want, we're afraid of death, but we also, we, it's not just that we want immortality because we don't want death. It be, it's that we want more and more good experiences. We, we have that drive to, we care about certain things and we enjoy certain things and we want more. Uh, other things equal, we want more. And we believe that immortality would lead to having more. Now, the curmudgeon's objections really are targeted at that point. They're going to say, no, immortality wouldn't give you more. but the drive for immortality, the, the optimist view is that we could have more and more. And that is, I, I would take it that having that desire is evolutionarily advantageous. Um, because if we didn't, there would be little motivation to stay healthy and to avoid dangers and obstacles. If we were really indifferent to our futures <laughs> or if we now of course you could say well we could care about the future we just don't need to want to be immortal um and we'd have to think more about that but i take it that at least the drive for more and more longevity gives us as a species um some advantage in natural selection so that's that's a good point let me, so Artem, thank you. And uh, the next Artem, <laughs> thank you also. Um, uh, very interesting points. Uh, I'm not familiar really with Orthodox, Russian Orthodox or Ro Orthodox in general theology. Um, coincidentally, I live on a little hill not far from the campus in Riverside and there's a rather large Orthodox church right on my hill. And um, I've taken tours of the, the church. I don't know if it's distinctively Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox, but it's just Orthodox. <laughs> um, but in any case, um, yeah, I, it was fascinating. You, can, you, you raised the possibility that death is an opportunity for transformation. And I think that's, it's, it's an interesting idea. And there has been some work recently in um, analytic philosophy on transformational experiences. Laurie Paul, P-A-U-L, at the University of North. Well, she used to be at Chapel Hill. Maybe now she's at Yale. She's written a lot about uh, how our practical reasoning and deliberation um, can't work, or at least can't work straightforwardly in context where a particular act would transform us uh, in deep ways. You know, how do you do long-term planning? So I do, I, you know, I think that's an interesting idea. I don't know. And so you point out that in Tolkien, um, 
the elves have secular immortality, but we have the gift of death. And I think there are people who think that in those terms. And in my view, immortality, in order for it to be worthy of choice, would have to have an exit strategy. So when you think about it, if we were truly immortal and not just medically immortal, we wouldn't have an exit strategy. Because if you're truly immortal, you can't die by any means, and including your own at your own hands, uh, suicide or uh, assisted suicide even, you couldn't die in those ways. And that then choosing that kind of immortality is very, very risky. Um, I want an exit strategy. <laughs> and so that is, I want the option that if things are going bad enough, then I can cause my own death. And if you think about it, if nothing else can kill you, how, how could you kill yourself? So you have to have medical immortality at most. Because, and in that sense, death is a gift. It's a gift in, you know, in that we don't have to live in horrible circumstances forever. But you're even talking about a deeper kind of gift that maybe it would be transformational, the state or status of being death, dead, not just looking forward uh, in the future to it but once we are dead once we are in the status have the status of being dead perhaps that transforms it um, and I think it's an interesting uh, question and I don't of course I don't know the answer to it but it, it's possible what I was focusing on is a more secular idea but what you point to is very important in our thinking about uh, longevity and even immortality, the desire for novelty. So actually, this is something I didn't really talk about in the book, but you could think of us as having three drives, you know, the that we all we obviously have other basic drives, but fear of death, desire for longer life, and also a fear of boredom. And uh, that's something that really drives us. Um, we're Boredom is a terrible state to be in. And so even in our finite lives, of course, we are mortal lives. We are often bored. We're sometimes bored. We're often bored. Sometimes that boredom is very deep, called uh, hyper boredom sometimes. But um, so we have a fear of that. And we try, we keep busy, uh, not just to uh, alleviate or uh, diminish our fear of death, but to um, you know, uh, address our fear of boredom. And some people are so busy, we even say they're busy, they're, they, they keep busy being busy or something like that. And um, so we want novelty. Um, and that's something that often drives us. Um, and so the idea that maybe when we're dead, it transforms us in novel ways is a hopeful picture to many people. And it also captures something that many people want in life. Um, okay, so Evgeny. Yeah, you raise excellent points. Um, and I agree that when uh, in a betrayal case, I have false beliefs about the world. I believe that my the people who present themselves as friends and friendly colleagues, um, are really that way. I believe these people really are my friends, but it turns out I'm wrong about that. So I have false beliefs and false beliefs about important things. So that's a difference. That's an important difference between uh, the case of being betrayed and the case of being dead, because when you're dead on the secular view, you don't have any more beliefs. Um, and I, I think that that is something that I would have to address. I did write a paper called Mortal Harm, M-O-R-T-A-L, Harm, that appears in a collection edited by Stephen Looper Foy. I think it's the, uh, or Steve, Stephen Looper might be his name now, uh, with Cambridge University Press, something like the Cambridge Companion to Death or something, in which I try and address that Point, I, I came up with some examples in which I claimed that um, it, it can be a, a very bad thing for someone to be in a certain context 
even though the individual does not have false beliefs about that context, about the things that are, in my view, harming them. And what I would say is, and so I, I tried to come up with cases like that, but which unfortunately I can't remember off the top of my head, but the stroke case is supposed to be that kind of case. And how it can work exactly, you were asking, is, is like this. So someone's in the prime of their life. Um, the, they don't, you don't have to have a family, obviously, uh, to live a wonderful life. But let's say she has a family, she has a job she loves, and somehow she can do both things, you know. There's always the question, can you have it all? And, uh, but she, she has everything she really wants, and she's flourishing. And in her sleep, she, she has a brain aneurysm or a stroke. Um, and I know there's a, a well-known philosopher, um, Jean Hampton, she was a good friend of mine. And when she was uh, 40 years old, she was uh, on a, uh, she was horseback riding in Arizona and she suddenly died of a brain and it was sudden. I don't think she was ever in any pain. It was uh, tragic and um, anyway, had had tragic impacts on her family, but um, I don't think she ever suffered, but you could imagine that kind of case where the individual just doesn't suffer, no pain, uh, but now they don't die, but they're now cognitively the status of a two-year-old or, you know, uh, so I think the individual has been harmed. A bad thing has happened to the individual. They've been deprived of a good life, of the life they were leading. But uh, it can't be understood in terms of bad experiences. They just didn't have any, they had a deprivation of good. And if you say, well, of course she didn't actually have pain or suffering or unpleasant experiences, but it deprived her of the good experiences she would have had. That, you know, the Epicurean can't say that because then death itself in general would be that so uh, that's the kind of case I want to lean on there. Um, the it, I agree it's very important to point out, and I I think I refer in the book to an article by Stephen Hetherington. He is now the editor of the Australasian Journal of Philosophy. Stephen Hetherington, and he made this point in an important article, the, the similar point to the one you're making of Jenny, where he says. You know, the problem with the betrayal, the betrayed person is, let's say it's a, he, he's living an absurd life. His, his life is absurd because really, as he puts it metaphorically, it's as if the universe is laughing at him because these individuals who present themselves as uh, his friends and as even maybe his family, as people who love him, they really hate him and despise him. So he's living this false, he has false beliefs. There's a lack of match between the external world and the internal world. You could say it's absurd. That's what uh, often absurdity is, a lack of match between the way you approach something and something more objective. Um, and that wouldn't be the case in death. So that's a, a, a fair point. And what a totally good point, and it's not easy to respond to, but what I try and do is um, I try and come up in this uh, paper, Mortal Harms, with some examples that address that. In the book, I thought it was too, it might be too complicated to go through all that, because it's supposed to be an introductory book. At least, you know, I tried to make it interesting uh, to even more advanced students. And, but it's supposed to reach into that. So I didn't come up with those, but I focus on the stroke case. Uh, and the stroke case is not one where there's this, it's not that the universe is laughing. Um, it's not as though the individual now thinks of herself or himself as a certain way, but they're really not. I mean, they are that way now. Anyway, um, so Andrew also asked about the meaning in life. And um, the non-delusion um, condition and the freedom condition, and he points out that on my view, a non-person could not have a meaningful life. And he 
invokes cases like uh, significantly impaired, cognitively impaired human being or a child. And um, my short answer, it's excellent questions. The way I think I approach it is to consider the concept of a person. And I think there are at least two main features of a person. One is um, having a, a, a right to life. And you might even say, and Michael Tooley, the philosopher, talks about a serious right to life. But if you think of rights, some rights are strong, some rights are weak, like the, the right of freedom of expression is strong, the right to private property. Um, well, that's not, that's more complicated. Uh, but I have a certain parking space at school, I have a right to park there, but it's not as strong a right as the right to freedom of expression. That means someone could, in an emergency, someone could park in my place without doing something morally objectionable. It would be infringing on my right, but not violating it, some people say. So anyway, I think a person has a strong right to life. And those, a child and an impaired human being, do have strong rights to life. They're fundamentally different from cats. Uh, don't tell my wife, but they're fundamentally different from a cat. Uh, you could euthanize a cat if they didn't have uh, owners and so forth, or humans, we like to say now they're, um, okay. But they, the other idea of personhood is they, they are members of the moral community. They can be held responsible for what they do. They can, we can make judgments about right and wrong, attribute moral properties to them. And that's where I think they don't have that property, uh, that part of personhood. So the way I would think of it is they're not full persons. Um, they don't have both of those features, but they are partly persons, you could say. They have one but not the other of the main characteristics in the concept of a person. So you can't just painlessly kill them. Now, and, but you don't say that a, a two-year-old, let's say, has acted uh, morally wrongly or should be held fully accountable or morally accountable when you punish the, the child or put them in time out, as we say, you know, force them to be alone for a while. You're not really fully holding them responsible. You're acting as if they were to teach them, to um, teach them over time how to be uh, a morally responsible agent. So um, they, they also, what's also complicated is you, there are other ways in which you can't legitimately treat a child or a a significantly impaired human being. You have to treat them with a kind of respect. And, but they are like us in certain ways and unlike in others. And um, they are, we are all animals. And so we are capable of experiencing pain. And in virtue of that, we all have the right, in my view, not to have unnecessary pain inflicted on us. So certainly a child or a cognitively impaired human has that right and the right to life, just not the right, let's say, to participate in political uh, uh, discussions or be held responsible. Very good. Um, the other point I wanted to get to, Let's say the chronicles of two people's lives are the same, but one is being manipulated uh, by an evil demon uh, or a, you know, a nefarious neurosurgeon who's secretly uh, manipulating, where, whereas the other isn't. But all the choices and actions are the same. Um, at least when I say actions, I mean physical movements, choices. Some people think if people are manipulated in that way, they're really not performing actions, but let's put that aside. Let's say they are performing actions. I do think that one of the lives is meaningful and the other one isn't because I do think having a meaningful life is having a narrative, I mean, part of it is 
that there is a narrative that corresponds to the life, that one's chronicle is a narrative. And one of the important features of narrativity is meaning holism. And I just don't feel that someone who doesn't have free will, someone who doesn't act freely has narrativity in the sense of meaning holism. I can't think of an example um, where that's true. And if you think of non-human animals, I think it's especially true that, you know, like uh, the example I use is if you take a dog to obedience school and the dog eventually, you know, learns how to obey a command, um, his obedience does not confer retroactively meaning, positive meaning on the times it was at the obedience school. Um, it just doesn't work like that. Um, it's different with human beings where, you know, successfully you can learn from past experiences or not, or you can be successful in a, a very in difficult, um, challenging um, task, like getting into medical school. When you get in that retrospectively, perhaps endows all those efforts with meaning. It doesn't work like that with a dog. And I, and I think it's because the dog can't act freely. Therefore, I'm inclined to think that a person who's manipulated thoroughly throughout their life can't lead a meaningful life. But again, this goes to questions about virtual meaningfulness. And there is a clear sense in which if we're all in a simulation that was set up by um, a, a, an adolescent, a teenager on planet Alpha, or <laughs> whatever that planet is way out there, that we are being importantly manipulated, even if it's not stimulation of our brain. So Anna raises the question of whether there can be something universal that's um, over and above our, the personal meanings. Um, and Vadim also, for different reasons, was wondering whether our species could have a meaning or there could be a meaning of life for human beings. And I think he was invoking evolutionary considerations and Anna was not, but perhaps was looking at boundary conditions like uh, the fact that we, in fact, being mortal will die, maybe sets a boundary condition and may establish some something universal. And so it's not just personal meaning. Um, I'm gonna have to think more about both of those points. I think what, um, what I want to say, of course, I mean, I, I don't know if I said this in the book, but I want to say that the meaning of an individual's life. So an individual can have greater and lesser meaning in their lives, but an individual can have a meaning of her life. And that's her narrative. That's the content of her story. Um, but the human species, but being a narrative and not just a chronicle, it has meaning holism. And so therefore it has to be the result of free action. So we write the story uh, by acting freely. Uh, so in a sense, we're creative, we're authors in the sense that we're writing the story of our lives. But there is no individual who's writing the story of the species. So that's why the species can't have a meaning in the sense, the same sense of narrativity. Um, are there certain universals at an abstract level, there might be. I mean, if you think of human beings as practical reasoners and as having goals that are set by our practical reasoning, yes, I mean, maybe that's objective, but it's not. Is the meaning of our lives understood as our, you know, we're creatures, the meaning is that we go after goals, that we strive to make, uh, fulfill our goals. I don't know if that's, if that is, it's at a very abstract level that doesn't really help in our specific thinking and evaluating meaning. Now, let me just back off and say some of the difficulties 
are because we don't know exactly what this notion is of meaningfulness. The way I think of it, there are different reasons for action, or uh, where a reason is a consideration that speaks in favor of a choice or an action. And um, these reasons can be characterized uh, in different ways. Uh, some set of reasons are moral or ethical, some are prudential, some reasons are um, aesthetic perhaps, some reasons are reasons of meaning. And they're not, they don't necessarily coincide because you can have a meaningful life that's not ethical, you can have an ethical life that only has minimal amount of meaning and so forth. Um, so, but meaningfulness gives a reason for action that then competes with the other reasons that an activity would be meaningful, gives me some reason to pursue it, uh, but not a decisive reason. Uh, I mean, I do hold a view that's not, not everyone holds and that may be, you know, people strongly disagree with. And that is you could be very evil like Hitler and still lead a meaningful life. I mean, I think Hitler's life was meaningful. It wasn't moral. We know that it was terrible. So, but what, so Hitler had um, reasons of meaningfulness, reasons of morality, reasons of prudence, but in his case, all things considered, you know, he made choices that we, we would say from our perspective were deeply, horribly wrong because his moral reasons objectively speaking, superseded and outweighed his other reasons. So, but I think meaningfulness has to give us reasons. And just to say, we have an interest in fulfilling our goals or achieving our goals doesn't really give you much guidance when you're acting. It's kind of like, I think of that as analogous to saying, the purpose of human life is to um, pursue the mission that we have that's given to us by God. Okay, find your purpose and the purpose given by God and fulfill your purpose. Um, okay, that's at a very abstract level uh, because now you want to know what did God, what purpose did God give me? Did God give everyone the same purpose? We are all human beings and we're all sacred, let's say, or sacred is not quite the word, but valuable, um, and we have sanctity, at least. Um, did God give us all the same purpose? Uh, then it really doesn't give us much um, guidance. Uh, meaningfulness then wouldn't be a reason that would help us. But then if we try and figure out what our specific purpose is, well, you know, it's how do we do that? Um, so I think, um, I want to think more about it. I, I take it, I take Vadim, you made a very good point that it's kind of like the, um, the evolutionary biology approach to ethics in a sense that the purpose of human beings um, is to reproduce, is to maximize our contribution to the gene pool, you could say. And so um, the species, you could say, anthropomorphizing wants to survive. The species uh, wants to continue or um, evolution, what? So, well, I don't know how to put it any better. You, uh, uh, Vadim, put it more elegantly than I did. But um, therefore, our purpose is to enhance as individuals, the species chances of survival. And that is to have more kids and more uh, offspring. Uh, and right and wrong then, if you're really an evolutionary um, ethicist, you could say, or if you take evolutionary biology as the guide to ethics, then right and wrong is defined in terms of our um, increasing or enhancing or detracting from our chances to uh, produce offspring, um, but I don't, I don't find it ethically attractive. Um, 
and I don't think it that view will ultimately correspond with our our reflective equilibrium you could say about right and wrong about meaningfulness I'm not sure um I, I want to think about it more but I agree you could say all right there is a meaning of life for any human being and it is now you could say the way, what I want to say is the meaning of life of an individual life is the content of their narrative and there is no meaning of the, the lives of all human beings um, that's the same okay there's no single meaning and that it follows that you know this you can't say that the meaning of all of our lives is to enhance the success or the, the prospects for the success of the species but that is another way of doing it. so in my view there's no author there's no single author of this the chronicle of the human species therefore the species if you think of it can't have narrativity um now but you know if you think of uh, and then i'll stop in a second but corporate entities can have narratives because corporations or groups can act in a synchronously or a in a coordinated way so they act as if they were agents or persons so you can think of corporate entities or groups as having uh, the capacity to write their narratives but the species as a whole is not like that we don't coordinate but I think Vadim's point would be, and this is a legitimate point, well, you don't have to look at meaning, objective meaning of human life in terms of an authorship and narrativity. There's another way of looking at it in terms of evolutionary success. And you could think of meaningfulness in that way. Um, like I say, I resist it because I think meaningfulness has to give us a reason for action and it's implausible that enhancing having more kids or uh enhancing the species success prospects really gives me a reason but maybe you'll want to say yes it gives you the meaningfulness reason just like hitler's um uh, increasing you know taking over this, you know, Czechoslovakia or the, the Sudetenlands and Poland, that gave him meaningfulness reasons, but not moral reasons. So maybe that's what you'd want to say. But okay, uh, there was one uh, last thing that I appreciated Anton's question very much and his kind words and the fact that he, um, you know, we had gone on a long time. So he focused on his one question, like uh, just about the end of the world. And um, I don't really talk about that. Um, I would distinguish the end of the world in the sense of the end of the planet's capacity to sustain human life or any kind of life, animal life, plant life, that we know many planets can't. And that would be one sense of the end of the world. Another sense is the heat death where the entire universe um, goes out of existence, you know, uh, in, in a heat death. And um, <clears throat> I think of immortality as, uh, you could think of medical immortality as not, uh, uh, as being invulnerable to death by natural causes, as long as the environment can sustain us. So, <clears throat> And true immortality would be invulnerability to death by any cause, <clears throat> as long as the planet can sustain life at all. So you would still be immortal if you lived until the heat death. <laughs> and you'd still be immortal if you lived until the planet no longer can support human life, uh, even though there's a sense in which you're not literally living forever. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Fisher, for wonderful answers and uh, presentation. Thank you, colleagues, for uh, wonderful questions. It was very uh, interesting discussion, I think. Yeah. But our seminar is uh, finished. Thank you very okay. much let for me, all of you. Thank you. But let me also say I want to express my gratitude. And I'm very happy to see familiar faces from my trip to Russia and also some new faces. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a nice day.